Good morning. Happy Baltimore Innovation Week, everybody. Happy to have you all on. Um, this session is being recorded. Now, I can't see how many participants. Oh, looks like there are 20, 17 participants. So let's just give everybody a minute to get on in. 19. Okay. 24. Excellent. People are already raising their hand. I love it. Okay. So the uh, tag phrase for Baltimore Innovation Week this year, which is the 10th annual, is celebrating good news stories and innovation in Baltimore. So happy to have you all here. Um, today. Oh, and here's Mike Rosenbaum. Great. Thanks for joining. <laughs> all right. We're all here. So welcome to Baltimore Innovation Week. Special thanks to Celine and of course, Deb Hillett from ETC for their 10th uh, Baltimore Innovation Week. I'm really, really psyched to be a part of it. I kudos to all of you godfathers and godmothers of the entrepreneurial community. Here. We're really, really happy to talk about all the good, bad, ugly, fabulous stuff going on in Baltimore today. So the title of this conversation is Baltimore is an Innovation Hub. What are we missing and what do we need to do next? And I've got my esteemed friends and colleagues here. So really, really happy to kick off this discussion. We've all been zoomed out. I totally understand. So I'm going to make this a little bit punchy um, here and ask everybody and put them on the spot for questions. So Kip's ready and Jeff and Mac are just going to have to go with it, right? <laughs> um, so <laughs> happy to have you all here. So let me just uh, read what we're supposed to be talking about today. So Baltimore's entrepreneurial ecosystem is growing and that's why you're here. Thank you for being here. Um, in this chat, we'll be discussing what's going well, but as importantly, what's missing branding, more investors, more mentors? How can we all continue to work together to make Baltimore a bigger, better, stronger entrepreneurial community? So this is how it's going to roll. Instead of me introducing the panelists today, I'm going to ask them questions and they're going to in introduce themselves as, as they're answering these questions. So happy to do that. And then we're going to have something that I call the high voltage round, which I've stolen from a, a group called Powerhouse Fund in my clean energy world, where the panelists are going to have to answer some questions, answer some or finish some sentences for, for us, and then we're going to have some closing questions. So um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Claire Broido Johnson. I've been a serial entrepreneur in Baltimore since 2002. Uh, Mike Rosenbaum, in fact, helped me with my legal documents as I was founding Sun Edison way back when. So happy to have you here, old friend. And um, I pivoted two years ago and I've been running something called the Maryland Momentum Fund since then, of which both Kip and Jeff are on our advisory board. So happy to see you both here today. Thank you for all your service. Um, we invest 250 to $500,000 in early stage startups loosely affiliated with the university system. I've made 22 investments in 22 months. So there's a lot to invest in in the Maryland market and happy to do that. And um, that's me. So I'm just going to be the MC, and we're going to hear from my esteemed friends and colleagues as we go through. So I'm going to ask Jeff Cherry first. What do we have in Baltimore that's worth celebrating? Hi, Claire. How you doing? Um, Jeff Cherry, I am the founder, CEO of the Conscious Venture Lab and the managing general partner of Conscious, uh, Conscious Venture Partners, which is a venture capital fund, Conscious Venture Lab as many of you may know, is an accelerator uh, here in Baltimore. We're focused on um, investing in underrepresented founders and looking for any technology innovation that's breaking down barriers to access or leveling the playing field. So <clears throat> what is there to celebrate in Baltimore? Um, you know, I'm not from Baltimore, as you know, Claire, I'm a New Yorker, I, so I chose to be here. So there's a ton to celebrate in Baltimore. I mean, just the fact that we, you know, we're doing this Baltimore Innovation Week thing for 10 years, we're still doing it even in the midst of a pandemic and people are showing up and people are leaning in. I think all of that is, uh, is admirable and things to celebrate. I think that 
Baltimore, I would say, is, you know, is parochial in the best sense of the word, that people really do care about this city and about what's happening here. Um, and, you know, they're, they're dedicated to making it better. So things to celebrate like the Maryland Momentum Fund, right? Like Catalyte, like Rare Breed Ventures, like all the things that Kip's doing. Like, I mean, you just look at this panel and look, at, look for things to celebrate here. So I think that um, uh, that there is, and I think that also there's a ton of momentum. When I first came to Baltimore in 2013, 2014, um, you know, I came from Wall Street. Um, I'd spent a lot of time in San Francisco. So assets. Uh, and eco now it's starting to turn into an ecosystem. It's starting to turn into where people are connecting trying to do things together, trying to, you know, sort of make the, you know, the, 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 the whole bigger than the pieces. So I think that those, all of those things are really worth, um, worth, uh, worth celebrating and worth uh, shouting about. You're muted now, Claire. I hate it when I do that. Okay. Um, Mac, thanks for joining today. What are the major funding gaps, either specific stages of capital or industries or technology types? And tell us a little about yourself. Uh, so Jeff got to get the positive question. I got the negative one, right? Okay, I get to be the bad guy. The way it is, Mac. Um, <laughs> Conwell, most of you know me as Mac. Um, uh, former entrepreneur, um, also used to work for Tedco, was there for four years, worked on the seed fund, then um, helped lead the team that started what is now known as the Builder Fund, which is the first and only state-backed pre-seed fund for women and minorities in the country something that Maryland should be very proud of. Uh -huh. And last September left that job to start Rare Breed Ventures, a pre-seed to seed venture fund. Um, and so when you think about Maryland and think about the funding gaps, everywhere you go, there's funding gaps in the friends and family realm, right? Like if you don't have yeah. the right friends and the right family, like or the right network, mm -hmm. honestly, then that's a gap that exists. But if we want to talk about Maryland, how we stack up we actually do fairly decent at early stage investing, right? You know, we have Tedco, we have the Momentum Fund, we have Conscious Ventures Labs, you know, we have some, some seed capital locally. Yeah. You start to see the gap once you go beyond seed and get the Series A, and once you go past Series A, the bottom falls out, right? Mm -hmm. We have a private equity here, and we have a lot of late stage, growth stage stuff. So if you're talking about, you know, Series D and beyond, we have that. You're talking pre-seed to seed, maybe seed plus. That's the thing that people talk about. We have some of that. Everything in between, it's not really as much here, right? Like yeah. you got revolution in DC, but you know, that's going to DC. I, I don't know how much, you know, pure series A capital we have locally. And so that's right. where I see the funding gaps. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things that I found, I've spent most of my career honestly, in Silicon Valley and Boston, because I've been in the clean energy industry. And, you know, the things that Baltimore and Maryland, of course, doesn't have is a bunch of people who have become wealthy in early stage startups, right? We've got pe people who have money in the Maryland market. And of course, I'm making a gross generalization, but they've made money from manufacturing or from real estate or from government contracting. We don't have a bunch of Facebook and Amazon alums who are willing to put their money where their mouth is. So, um, so that actually leads me to my qu next question to Kip. So Kip, please, thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself. And the question for you is how, is, how important is it that our companies have access to local capital? And should we focus on mobilizing this capital or focusing on importing it? Thanks, Claire. Um, great to be here. Um, and uh, so I'm uh, Kip Cernakis, co-founder and managing partner of Epidaryx Capital. Um, we're a seed and series A life science only venture fund, um, primarily therapeutics and devices. Um, we like to build companies from scratch and primarily out of universities. Um, our whole underlying thesis actually is that we believe that there's great innovation outside of the major hubs. So as I sit here and um, talk about um, you know, Baltimore and Maryland more broadly, um, there, there are, as we all know, great institutions here, and we're, um, we're very, very pleased to be and proud to be um, kind of sitting here and, and working together in the ecosystem. Um, and I actually think that it's really imperative that there are local investors and there are local investors of scale. Um, you know, one of the things that um, the venture business is 
Um, it's a relationship game and a lot of heavy work is done, especially at the early stages um, for the life science industry. Um, I would actually argue a little bit against Mac in that there isn't a lot of pure seed investing for the life science side of things. That's true. Um, and so um, being able to have um, investors that know what they're doing, that have scalable pools of capital that can roll up their sleeves and, and put money to work is actually quite important in trying to grow an ecosystem. Um, importing is great. Um, and, um, you know, I think a good mix of both is important. And, and our friends at Baltimore Venture Partners are doing a good job at trying to, to catalyze this. Um, but a lot of times when you import um, venture capital in, especially at the early stages, they'll put, you know, a person, maybe if we're lucky, um, it's usually somebody more junior, um, and you don't have necessarily the um, the um, the firepower, if you need, if you will, that to, to get deals done, uh, the champions to really get deals done. So I actually think it's really, really important to grow this, to grow the investor community here, and to have local institutions actually also supporting the and growing the investor community in the, in the local area. Yep. Totally agree. That's actually a pretty nice segue to Mike Rosenbaum. So Mike's been starting, started his company many, many years ago, and would love to hear a little bit about his story. And my understanding is you have not invested, you don't have very many Maryland investors. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that and where you've raised your money. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Glad I was able to sort of come in and pinch hit at the last minute. <laughs> my name is Mike Rosenbaum, and I'm a, I've been a serial entrepreneur here, as Claire said, for many, many years. Um, although I don't like putting too many nannies on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and um you know and you know, i'm now running for governor in part um based on the idea that we need a, a bigger vision for our ecosystem that can take us to scale um and my first company is called catalyte um it's based on the premise that talent's evenly distributed the opportunity isn't and it's uh, uh essentially applying data to identify potential my second business is called arena um, I have a third business you'll be hearing about soon called Anthem um, <laughs> that has not fully been launched yet, but sort of in the in the works. Um, but my first company did not had almost no local investors. Um, and you know, and, and when I think about sort of what this ecosystem looked like 21 years ago when I started Catalyte, um, you know, there was not much here. And part of it was, and I think we've still still seen a little sliver of this is. Um, the question is, are we sort of talking from a perspective of scarcity or a perspective of abundance? You know, as entrepreneurs and investors, what we think about is like that we can make the pie bigger, you know, that we can scale things, that there's opportunity. But because of the sort of nature of the history of, of our region and regions like ours, you know, there's a there's a, an approach that we many people have developed, which is, well, it's not going to work, you know, zero sum, risk aversion, you know, which really does limit the ability to do things, which sort of takes us to, you know, sort of how you think about the role of local investors. And when I first started as an entrepreneur, you know, for those of you who are entrepreneurs in the audience, you will appreciate this. People said, you know, don't just think about investors as capital. And I said, that sounds great, but I need to admit a payroll. Like, and so, <laughs> so that's a great idea, but like really anyone who will give me a dollar, I appreciate. Um, and, and so that's sort of how entrepreneurship starts. I will tell you though, when I first started as an entrepreneur, um, because I was sort of just taking money from wherever I could get it, I didn't get some of the other help I needed. Right. And the help I really needed, and I've sort of seen this as with friends that have started business and scaled businesses is understanding what excellence looks like. Um, you know, when you start as an entrepreneur, you know, a lot of the time, you know, you may have worked in a bigger company and you thought you thought knew what excellence looked like there, or you may have sort of seen a business before you may have an, an amazing idea, but really understanding what excellence looks like. What does a 10 X growth look like? What does a hundred X look like? What does a thousand X look like? Um, and there's a, what are the pitfalls to avoid, but just sort of how do you think about it? And I didn't really get that mentorship as much in the early years. And part of it was the investor ecosystem that I was sort of working with. And part of it also was just the ecosystem itself didn't exist. You know, you can get that from an investor, but you can also get it from, you know, a friend who's a cash dot entrepreneur. I mean, Claire is a perfect example of a fabulously successful entrepreneur who's now an investor, um, you know, and frankly, everyone on this panel has seen excellence you know, kind of can, can pattern spot excellence, can help with excellence. Um, and, you know, and obviously there's a different perspective from the entrepreneur perspective, but, you know, but sort of getting that is, is just so profoundly important 
when we think about businesses, not only that, you know, can grow to be hundred million dollar exits, which is, which sounds great when you're starting, but what we really need in this region is billion dollar exits and $10 billion exits and bigger exits than that. And that's really what will supercharge an ecosystem. And to do that, we need an ecosystem of investors and others who can frankly identify what world-class excellence looks like yeah. and help support it. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. And so that's actually a nice segue to the next question and probably to Mac and to Jeff, but also to Kip. So, you know, there are lots of new accelerators, incubators around here, right? Among them, the ones that you guys are running. And I think those are really critical to maximizing access to capital and to learnings and teachings about excellence, particularly among underrepresented minorities and women and things like that. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing to try to, to support underrepresented founders in Baltimore. Mac, you wanna go first? I was gonna let you go first, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> Y'all wanna get me with the hard one. So for me, what I'm doing for underrepresented families in Baltimore is, is making sure that they're seen, right? Like I do not owe them anything, right? The only thing I owe them is giving them the opportunity and making sure they have access to the opportunities, right? Like. At the end of the day, you know, a rare breed, we're a venture fund, right? We're, we're, our job is to return capital to our LPs. Like, hate to break it to you folks, but VCs are nothing but money managers. We manage money for other people, and our job is to make them more money. That is fundamentally my job, right? And so knowing that is my job to invest in the best companies, and I invest in companies all across the country, including Latin America and in Canada, right? And so... What do I oh, what what am I doing for underrepresented founders? I'm making sure that I'm giving them a look and giving them a shot. I'm making sure that once COVID's over, that I'm getting out of my house and going to the places that they're at, going to the events that they're at, going to the meetups that they're at. There aren't going to be the same places, the same meetups that we're going to see during Baltimore Innovation Week, right? Like, like it's great that we have all these great events, but a lot of these events. And a lot of the places we go to, while they are open to inclusion, they they fundamentally aren't inclusive. If you just look in the rooms, they're not, right? And so right. in order to make them more inclusive, we have to get out and help those people and bring them to these rooms or go to the rooms that they're at and making sure that I'm always evangelizing the work that Teco does, right? What we built over there at Teco with the Builder Fund is very incredible and it's, and it's a unique fund. And so to, to let entrepreneurs know like, hey, there aren't as many pools of capital out there for that super early company, but there are pools that exist and these are the places to go. So making sure that we're sharing that information and making sure everybody is seeing that's what we're doing. Awesome. So I would say um, we're doing much of the same thing, right? Um, I mean, I, I would say that our job is to, you know, if we want to, and I do want to support underrepresented founders, is to get into those communities. Because here's the thing that I know, is that they're not getting capital, not because they're not talented, is it because no one knows they're there or no one's paying attention to them. So what we do is, you know, much like Mac, I'm, an adventure, I'm a venture capitalist. I'm a capitalist. Um, I talk about conscious capitalism all the time. Um, uh, stakeholder capitalism, I was, uh, you know, early to that scene and I'm a capitalist. And what we're trying to get people to understand is that those two things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, because we get into communities that other people aren't paying attention to, we're finding deals that other people aren't paying attention to. I'm getting those deals, frankly, at a better valuation because there's less capital going into those communities, to be honest. So when I talk to my investors, I'm like, look, this is a really smart thing to do. We're not narrowing our aperture, right? We don't like Mac. We don't only do anything. There's a lot of fir firms out there that have popped up since George Floyd, and you know, in the last 14 months, they were only going to invest in minority founders. They're only going to invest in black and brown folks. We're only going to invest in women. I think that's fine. Um, and in some ways, I also think it's damaging because it suggests that if we open up the aperture, that those entrepreneurs can't compete. And I know that they right. can. And we're already proving it. Right. We don't have it. We don't make quotas in our selection process. 
We don't, you know, we just say we're going to, you know, we're going to, it's like, it's like that old ad, someone says, well, we are only hire the best people. And my, my question is, well, did you talk to everybody? So right. if you did, because if you didn't talk to everybody, how the hell do you know? Right. right? Yep. So what we try to do is talk to more people. We try to open up the aperture, get into the communities, find as many people as we possibly can, and then pick the best. It just so happens that if you go in those communities, sometimes, oftentimes, those underrepresented entrepreneurs will have the best ideas. And that's what we're proving out. So I think that we're doing much of the same as Mac, making sure that they're seen, making sure that they're heard, making sure that they know that we are here. And then the other thing that we do specifically is that we expose them to, uh, as Mike was saying, people who know exactly what excellence looks like, right? We have right now over a hundred mentors in the Conscious Venture Lab. And lots of those mentors are people that not only you know here, but everybody knows. Kip Tyndall from, uh, you know, uh, from the Container Store and Seth Goldman from Honest Tea and Tom Gardner from The Motley Fool and Olin Douglas from Motley Fool Ventures and Ed Freeman, university professor at Darden and Raj Sasodia, the author of Conscious Capitalism. We're exposing our entrepreneurs, not only our minority entrepreneurs, but all of our entrepreneurs to a network of people that they really couldn't gather on their own, right? We're, we're using our leverage to gather that network and bring them around them. So I think those are the two things that, that you know, we're doing uh, as Mac, making sure they're seen, getting into the communities, exposing them to uh, networks that they might not otherwise have. Um, and then, you know, um, looking at, you know, try also, I think the last thing is we check our own bias every day too, right? right? We have to check our own bias at the door every single day because just like, just because they look like me and I look like them don't mean, doesn't mean I can't be fooled. So those are the things that we, we spend a lot of time thinking about. Hey, Claire, can I add a couple things? Yeah, please. Um, yeah. So I, I couldn't agree more with Mac and Jeff um, uh, from a, from a female a answer, um, you know, as a female uh, majority women led and run organization, um, we don't specifically go out looking for female founders. Um, to some extent, they find us, and and a lot of it is also um, we we are able to connect on a different level, um, and um, a lot of times, um, how do I put this? When um, when a woman pitches, for instance, um, they will pitch a lot differently in many cases than a man, um, and so being able to kind of be be at the table and um, understand those differences um, and appreciate them and actually mentor them and and see that there are you know there are more than one ways to to approach something but you still have to have as Jess say you, you still have to have the talent you still have to prove yourself and all of those things but being open to maybe looking at the a situation in a different filter in a different lens I think is really important um, as we're trying to to support and grow um, but just like Mac and Jeff you know, we'll invest in, in, you know, what we think are the best companies because we've got to return capital. Um, <laughs> as it turns out, um, actually in our, in our, we are kind of starting to keep stats and we're um, noticing that probably about 50% of our companies have um, female or minority C-level execs or board members. And we actually then are able to increase our network for these companies and add team members to them. So it kind of, it feeds itself to some extent. It feeds for sure. The other thing I'll add is, and my fund is industry agnostic. So we're investing in med tech and aquaculture and education technology and deep science and all sorts of things. And something that Squadra VC brings up and I think is really relevant is what investors can do to expand the diversity of a team. So you might have four people who look exactly the same, but once I invest in them, I need to help them for, for employees five through 10 to make sure that employees five through 10 don't look exactly like the first four founders, right? Whoever those people may be. And that's not, that's not easy, but it's not, you know, it, it, it takes concerted effort, but that's part of why I love organizations like Baltimore Innovation Week is it's, it's bringing up the story and making sure everybody has access. There's a, you know, there's a Maryland Entrepreneur Hub, which we just spent money on TEDCO commerce and university system to make sure everybody has access to exactly the same resources, right? So, I mean, it's really like giving access and then giving 
people the tools to use what exactly exists. Yeah, and Jeff, you just raised your hand. Yeah, Claire, I just, two things I'm quick on that. I think, you know, one of these, one is, you'll, if you're looking for it, you'll find it, right? So we're, we're looking for the best entrepreneurs. We're also looking in places where other people aren't looking. So, so far we've invested over 60% of our capital in minority or female founders. It, it's far and away, if you, everyone here knows the numbers in venture capital, it, it's, you know, it's orders of magnitude better. One of the other reasons we do that, not because we think, all, we think it's the right thing to do, but another reason we do that is that because when I went to Wall Street, what I knew about Wall Street could have rolled around the thimble for a month. So I spent basically two years trying to figure out what the hell we were doing in this, in this world of stakeholder capitalism. And here's what we found out. Um, and we put $700 million behind it. Diverse teams outperform. So, I mean, you know, in some ways, you just have to open up your mind a little bit, right? Um, take off the blinders and understand actually what the numbers say. It's a little bit more work uh, than if you don't want to do that. But if you do it, guess what? We end up returning more money to our investors. So, right. Right. So I want to get to, oh yeah, please, Mike. Um, so, you know, my first business is based on this premise that talent's evenly distributed, but opportunity isn't. I think the same thing just for the entrepreneurial ecosystem, obviously. Um, but, you know, but when, one of the ideas was that there were sort of systemic issues that limited access um, for certain groups of people um, to opportunities in software engineering. Obviously, software engineering is received a profession, right? So, so, but so is entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, and so for example, when what Cadillac does, it just looks for the best people. It's just looking for the best people. And to Jeff's point, you know, when you look for the best people, what happens in software engineering is that the demographics of the folks you identify look almost identical to the metro areas where you're operating. So Cadillac operates nationwide, obviously headquartered here, um, you know, but just in software engineering, for example, the Baltimore metro area is about 28.7% African-American and historically 28% of folks who are in the top 2% of all software engineers are African-American in Baltimore, when identified by Cadillac. Like, and literally that almost identical number applies literally in every city that Cadillac operates in. Um, you know, what we're talking about here is really an entrepreneurial ecosystem and entrepreneurial talent. And you, know, and you know it exists the same way, and yet the systems in place, which part of what we're talking about really is personal networks, those, those systems create barriers and you, you can overcome those, but you need to do it at scale. Um, we can do it on sort of a one-off basis. We can each sort of do our part, but unless we do this at scale with investments, you know, that frankly probably begin with a B, not an M, um, you know, that will unlock economic value that will be an order of magnitude or two past that B investment, right? That, you know, but that's really, we need to use sort of overwhelming force to change that system. And that's fundamentally how we can move the needle on this. And if we do, we will unlock the entrepreneurial energies of everyone in our region, everyone in our community, um, not just sort of the narrow sliver of folks who have access today. Well, Mike, I couldn't agree with you more. I look at what what New York did for the life sciences industry, um, and they, you know, they're right there behind, you know, Boston and California now, because the state and at the time, you know, Bloomberg put in hundreds of millions, close to a billion over time. It was close to a billion dollars to 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 get corporates to come in to support the system to support the industry, and they're just knocking it out of the park now. Um, and we need that very similar um, approach here, I think. Yeah. So we're going to go to the question part of the the um, this talk because we only have till 9:45. So, just in alphabetical order, I'm going to ask each of you the, uh, to finish these sentences. The most effective way to create an entrepreneurial hub or innovation cluster is dot dot dot. Kip, I'm going to ask you first. You're still on uh, I would, yeah. Yep, I would say don't go it alone. Um, make sure that you get critical mass. Um, one of this might be not be popular to say at a at a at a Baltimore innovation system, but Baltimore is part of Maryland. Build on the strengths. Um, really try to market and um, engage corporates, engage investors, and 
um, the really trying to kind of um, find a way to, to bring more money as a collective group and not be, try to be like everybody else. Yep, Jeff. Can you repeat the sentence? Of course. <laughs> the most effective way to create an entrepreneurial hub or innovation cluster is dot, dot, dot. Um, play to your strengths, I think, right? I think that um, oftentimes we want to be, um, the, you know, the next Austin or the next Boston yeah. or the next San Francisco. Um, and we don't have all the same assets that they have. So I think that one of the things we have to do is be honest about the assets. We haven't played our own assets, right? So not being the next anything, but let's be the first Baltimore, right? Yeah. Let's be the best Baltimore can possibly be and have people want to emulate us. So I think um, play to us, I, I would just, this is additive because I would have said a lot what Kip was going to say, but adding to that is play to your strengths, right? Yeah. Look at what you, the resources you have, double down on those resources and use that to leverage to get other things to come towards you. Great, Mac. You need some wins. I mean, if you really want to talk about innovation clusters, they happen around, or they're centered around where you have companies that exit. And when a company exits, all the C-level execs become, you know, wealthy. The first, call it 50 to 100 employees, all become wealthy enough to be considered accredited investors. And when that happens, if those individuals then pour that read their resources back into the community, you get a hub. And so a great example of this is if you look at Birmingham, Alabama, the company Ship. Ship got bought by Target for half a billion dollars. They now have an ecosystem growing up around that one exit, right? And there are a few others that have happened, but when you have that happen and then those executives, those entrepreneurs, those individuals who start those companies then need to spin off and then become mentors in the ecosystem, angel investors, and also start venture firms. And then some of those early employees go off and start spinning off their own companies. That's how you get things like the PayPal mafia and things like that. So if you want to create a, 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 a ecosystem like that, you get, you get those, those first few big wins and then build off of that. Mike. Uh yeah, I couldn't agree more with Mac and Jeff, yeah. Jeff frankly. <laughs> um, you know, I, one of my favorite things is when I see Catalyte alums starting companies. Like, that is always, like, my favorite. That is, like, one of my favorite right. things to watch. Um, and obviously, you know, Catalyte has, you know, sort of various stages in its life cycle. So, you know, there will be more and more of those, you know, hopefully in the months and years to come. Um, but I think, you know, frankly, um, to some of the points we've been talking about, well, one of them is sort of how do we play to our strengths and, you know, this region can be the global center of certain industries. One of them is impact innovation, actually. You know, sort of innovations that serve folks outside the incredibly narrow de demographic that Silicon Valley and the traditional tech ecosystem have served. And we can be the global center of that, but it will require massive investments um, and getting us to scale. So again, with a B, not an M. Um, the other piece is when we think about things like impact innovation, the state itself should be one of the first customers of every startup. The fact that it yes. isn't it is crazy. You know, I mean, you think about the economic value in the state that's generated by a customer um, and being an early customer, committing as an early customer, you know, the state can be that customer and it also should be essentially providing the infrastructure and the seed capital. By seed capital, I mean, again, large amounts of capital using models like New York and Boston and Denver and Pittsburgh um, to, to attract an order of magnitude or two more private capital. And that will allow us to be the global leader. Um, and we need to be the global leader to keep talent here and to yeah. attract talent here, which will keep capital here and attract capital here. I think keeping talent here is a really huge part of the discussion. So I founded Sun Edison in 03 and clean energy just isn't in the Baltimore area. It's in Silicon Valley and Boston. And quite literally, I, I and two other people are Three other people are the only people from Sun Edison who are still here. Everyone else has moved to DC, they've moved to Silicon Valley, they've moved to Boston because there just aren't enough opportunities here. And so as you think about innovation clusters, it also has to be, you know, what as as Jeff and Mac and Kip and all of you have said, you know, what is it that we have here? One thing we have here is blue economy or blue tech, which is defined as healthy harbors, shipping, offshore wind, um, you know, make aquaculture 
fish farming, all of those things, what photovoltaics, let's put voltaics, you know, photovoltaics in the water, right? Like, so, and how do you work with UMSIS and IMET and all of the, you know, uh, and all of the different entities and early charm to make sure you can create enough opportunities so people stay here. That's something that, that I think is really hard. Um, another thing which we haven't brought up yet, but a, a lot of you are aware of is an organization called Upsurge Baltimore, which is trying to work on growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem also. And they're bringing in tech stars, which is expensive, but hopefully worthwhile because they are bringing 500 VCs along with them. Techstars is invested in, I think, 2,200 companies. They're being required to bring at least 10 companies to Baltimore. And the, the, the pitch for Upsurge is Equitech, equitable technologies, right? So, you know, as I go to Silicon Valley in Boston, as I have done for most of my career, it's really, 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 really white, really white. <laughs> and we are not really white in Baltimore. And so how do we... As you know, Mac and Jeff and everybody's been talking about how do we make sure that as Catalyte is, you know, talent is just distributed equally, opportunities are not. How do we make sure we support those talents, right? So um, I did want to ask another question of each of you, and again, we'll go in alphabetical order. And I know we only have a couple minutes left, but one question I had for each of you is: When I was starting to work on investing in startups, I wish I would have known. Dot, dot, dot. Kip first, alphabetical order. So I'm going to change the question slightly. I wish I, I wish I would have found a mentor that had been a, an investor before. Learning and growing and starting a venture fund is uh, just like any other business. Um, it is starting your own business. And, you know, having that network, all the things we talked about here, um, you know, it's it's difficult to do, and I wish I had 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 a mentor to to guide the way. And I will just say, with the ultimate gratitude and and thankfulness, that you are one of my mentors, Kip, as is Jeff. So thank you. I appreciate you, um, Jeff. When I was starting to work on investing in startups, I wish I would have known. Um, I wish I would have. I wish I would have known. I wish I would have paid more attention to the stuff I already knew. Um, I wish I would have known how hard it was going to be to raise capital. Um, and I wish I had a mentor and then knew how hard it was going to be to raise capital. I wish I would have known it's uh, the, uh, too many. <laughs> um, I think that's the, that's the big bucket. I wish I would have known how hard it was going to be to raise capital. I came from an environment that, although it's not always like this, when they say, performance is what really matters. It ends up getting to performance really matters. It's not always like that in the beginning, but on Wall Street, sooner or later, if you're performing, people will say, okay, I mean, we raised $700 million in a year and a half. And I said, okay, how hard can this be? Well, yeah. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> so I wish I would know how hard it was going to be. <laughs> Mac. I wish I had known, well, one, I wish I had had good mentors up front to let me know what the journey really was. I wish I knew what networking was and what it meant. When I started my first company in 2010, I didn't know what networking was. And networking has probably been one of the most valuable things that has happened for me over the last you know, 11 years. Um, and I wish I had known to focus more on just building a good company and getting customers and not chasing fundraising, right? Fundraising is a tool for growth. It's not a thing for you to make your dreams come true, right? But I didn't have anybody tell me that until I was two and a half years into my first journey, right? So things I wish I had known. Thank you for sharing. That's really valuable. And Mike. So if we just define investing in startups as starting startups, which is probably, sure. <laughs> I guess I would say, I wish I had known that we would be here now. Um, when I first started in Baltimore 21 years ago, you know, there were ecosystems, but not much. You know, they were, you know, the, they were dominated, frankly, by lawyers and accountants. Not that I don't love lawyers and accountants, um, you know, but <laughs> we need lawyers and accountants. I'm very grateful for lawyers, lawyers and accountants. But, but to see how robust 
you know, our ecosystem has become at sort of at kind of every level. Um, obviously, we have a lot of work to do to get ourselves to scale. Um, but sort of the energy that exists among startup founders and this community and the fact that Innovation Week even exists um, is so fabulous. And I will tell you, there were years in the early days of Catalyte when I was like, am I really this alone? And to know that there is this here now, and this creates the DNA that makes so much else possible. Um, just, I wish I had known because it would have given me a sense of optimism that you know that there were moments where I did not quite have that optimism. So <laughs> understood, yeah, and I remember some of those. So I would love to speak with all of you all day. You're all mentors to me, and I'm grateful, very, really, really, truly, to all of you. Um, but Baltimore Innovation Week has to go on, so I'm just going to post the next sessions. Look really awesome. So I've just put in the link where to go for the next sessions. I very much appreciate the mentors and friends on this call who have joined me today. Thank you for imparting your wisdom to the community. Thank you for your do, doing what you're doing for all of our entrepreneurs out there and happy spring and good luck with the cicadas, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.